Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Thursday, May 19th. And tonight, we're talking to the head of the USDA about fixing the baby formula shortage. We'll get the latest on the White House's plan from Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack. He's taking your questions on getting formula to store shelves and on rising food prices. When might we get some relief in our grocery bills? A $40 billion aid package for Ukraine is on President Biden's desk. The Senate passed it today. We are live in Kyiv with more on where that funding will go. Also, we're still watching Pennsylvania. The Republican Senate primary remains too close to call. And how do you talk about politics with the people you can't stand? It can be done, and some college students are leading the way. We'll show you how in tonight's feature report. The U.S. is deeply invested in Ukraine winning this war against Russia. Now its investment is getting deeper in a very big way. Today, Congress passed an aid package for Ukraine worth $40 billion. It includes military, economic, and humanitarian assistance. President Biden is on his first presidential trip to Asia right now, but the administration says he plans to sign the bill while traveling. If that happens, America's aid to Ukraine will total nearly $54 billion. Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby said the U.S. will not keep Ukraine waiting. That stuff will start to flow very, very soon. I cannot give you an exact date of when it's all going to show up in Ukraine, but you can imagine, having seen us do this in the past, that we're not going to sit on our hands. We'll start flowing that stuff uh, immediately. Meanwhile, Russia says that more Ukrainian soldiers have surrendered at that steel plant in Mariupol. Russian troops are pushing to take over the area. And today, President Biden welcomed the leaders of Sweden and Finland to the White House. He said that both countries meet every requirement for joining NATO. NBC's Cal Perry starts us off tonight from Kyiv. And Cal, let's start with that funding package. President Zelensky said that it is a significant contribution in a tweet. Talk more about the impact that all this funding might have on top of the aid that America has already given. Well, a lot of it is going to go towards reconstruction. So much of the early tranche of aid was that military aid. And while that's a big portion of this aid, and I think we can put up a full screen that we have that kind of breaks it down, um, you can see that the aid is parceled out partly for rebuilding, partly for embassy support operations. And when we take a step back, and we should frame this for the viewer, if you take away what USAID is part of the State Department budget, the portion that they get, this is a bigger budget than the U.S. State Department gets. So it is an incredible amount of money coming into Ukraine, um, and it is certainly not lost on Ukrainian officials this amount of money. You really have two separate things going on. Again, you have what is needed on the front lines, and certainly in the eastern part of the country. You need artillery pieces. You need more and more ammunition to be replenished because, of course, the Ukrainian army has been expending all that ammo. And then in places where I am, like Kiev, you have the suburbs that need to be rebuilt. You have people coming back to their homes. You have millions of refugees trying to return. Um, and so a great deal of that money is going to be diverted towards purposes like that and specifically to infrastructure, so that when people come home, hopefully they have power, they have water, they have the things they need to rebuild their lives, Joshua. One of the pieces that we showed in that list that just came up is $15 billion for, among other things, refugee and humanitarian aid. And one of the big humanitarian concerns right now is that millions of tons of grain are trapped in Ukraine. And the UN and yep. world leaders are highlighting what is about to become a food crisis. Where does that stand right now? I, I think Russia has said that it's willing to open the ports if some sanctions go away. That seems unlikely. So where does that leave us? Yeah, countries across NATO really saying that that's a way to hold the world hostage. And you have increasingly world leaders talking about it. It came up today at the G7. You had testimony at the United Nations today from the World Food Program. Look, there's grain enough to feed some 400 million people just sitting in storage across this country, most of it near the Black Sea in these port cities. Um, and the Ukrainian government is not able to get this grain and this wheat um, out to the world. And so you have a creeping food crisis where you would already have a food crisis. It's 
it's now more acute. So the Horn of Africa, which was already going to see a crisis, partly because of the climate, partly because of what has been going on there, is now going to have a more acute crisis. Countries that were on the edge, countries like Lebanon, are now going to go over that cliff, according to the World Food Program. So you have a concern that the war here is starting to affect countries that were already going to be affected, but now in serious ways. Add to that the global economy starting to falter, so you have food prices rising, and again, the climate crisis that's playing out across the globe is taking a, a, a bad situation and making it, it much, much worse. As you said, Russia offering to start exporting uh, some of that grain. Again, a non-starter for countries like the United States and for other countries around the world because it's a way of sort of appeasing uh, Putin. We were talking last night about Finland and Sweden joining NATO and Turkey's opposition to that and President Erdogan raising really peripheral issues that don't have anything to do with the war in Ukraine specifically in terms of not allowing their applications to be fast-tracked. Where does that stand today? I believe the administration said that President Biden had no plans to meet with President Erdogan, that he was willing to but hadn't planned to. Has there been any more movement on that? So the White House is downplaying um, Turkey's threats to sort of hold it up. And, and what's interesting about this is you have, again, um, you have differing sort of sort of rhetoric. You have Erdogan on one hand saying that he's going to hold this up and, and that Sweden shouldn't even bother coming to Turkey to discuss it. And then today you had the president of Finland at the White House saying it's not really such a big deal, that there would be a political solution to this. Um, and again, what we're talking about here um, is by and large an issue uh, that Turkey is worried about, the PKK, which is the Kurdish Workers' Party um, has been in the eyes of Turkey, um, a terrorist organization. It is in the eyes of the United States as well, a terror organization. But around the world, it's seen more as a gray area. And Turkey has been carrying out a war uh, for 40 years on the Kurds. It was shelling villages in Syria um, yesterday. So Turkey sees this as a moment now to have this discussion, to try to leverage its vote um, against countries like Finland and Sweden, which are housing um, a number of Kurdish refugees. Turkey calls them dissidents. So you get an idea there of the differing views and how Turkey and Finland and Sweden are now finding themselves um, having to deal with this internal uh, Turkish issue. Again, hearing from the president of Finland today, he downplayed it. He said it's not going to be a big deal. We are going to come to an agreement about our security concerns and their security concerns. I think that's partly why the president said he didn't think it was necessary uh, to meet with the Turkish president, Joshua. Does either side have leverage over the other? I mean, it's easy for the president to say, ah, oh, this isn't going to be a big thing. But if President Erdogan says, yeah, it is, I'm wondering where push meets shove and who actually has the power to force a resolution. So in the near term, Turkey has the leverage, right? They can hold this up by saying they're not going to vote for it. It only takes one country to veto it, um, and they could veto it. Big picture, do they have the leverage? I'm not sure. The U.S. has bases all over Turkey. There's a lot of funding that goes to Turkey as far as its security needs that the U.S. is giving. Um, so the U.S. could pull that leverage out, and, and, and so could these other NATO nations. I, I do think, and when you listen to um, officials from G7, when you listen to officials from NATO, the way that they frame it is that Turkey can see this moment in time um, to have this conversation. But look, I I think your concern is the right one. How long does this play out? And in the interim, you have a war raging in Ukraine, and they really, the Ukrainian officials here say they really want Finland and Sweden to join because they see that as sort of switching the balance of power and, again, strengthening, strengthening NATO. Thank you, Cal. That's NBC's Cal Perry starting us off tonight from Kiev. We have been focused on the midterm elections here in the U.S., but there's another election worth watching. Now, as we said, Joe Biden's making his first trip to Asia as president. He's heading to South Korea right now, to Seoul. The president plans to meet with the new South Korean president and with the prime ministers of Japan, India, and Australia. They'll be meeting, as you can see, on Tuesday. But Australia's PM has more to think about than that meeting. He's up for re-election, and millions of Australians will vote this Saturday in parliamentary elections. Scott Morrison has been Australia's prime minister since 2018. He is a member of its Liberal Party. If he wins, this would be his fourth term as PM. Now, recent polls show the race could be tight. His challengers include opposition leader Anthony Albanese of the Australian Labour Party. Joining us now from Melbourne is Josh Taylor, a reporter for The Guardian Australia. Mr. Taylor, welcome. Good to have you with us. Good to be here. So if I'm an Australian voter, what are some of the top two or three issues that are driving me to the polls this year that would help determine which party I might want in power? 
I think this election has really been uh, fought on cost of living issues. So uh, in similar sort of situations as what's going on in the United States, um, inflation has been quite a big issue. It, it's running at 5.1% at the moment and uh, wages are not keeping up with it. So uh, we just had wage data come out and then they'd risen by about 2.4%. So there's a bit of a gap there. And the Labour opposition has been making the point that um, in, in real terms, it means the wages are going backwards here. and they, they're sort of arguing that um, minimum wage at least needs to sort of keep in line with that. And, and that's been a point of uh, issue with the, with the government because uh, the minimum wage in Australia is set by a, an independent body called the Fair Work Commission and um, the government has, has essentially accused Labor of, of basically trying to force their hand on it and they're saying, you know, we've got to let the independent process do its work and, and figure all that sort of stuff out. The other thing that's sort of been, been front of mind um, in a lot of cases, is the is the issue of home ownership. So, uh, both parties are sort of pledging different things. Um, Labor is saying that that they'll help around ten thousand people get into their first home by taking a forty percent stake in the home. Um, the the government last week came out with their plan of of allowing people to rate up to forty percent of their super, um, uh, which is what we call retirement savings in in Australia. Um, right. to, to fund a house deposit and saying it's your money, you can do what you want with it. So that, that's sort of been a key issue. Climate change has also been quite a key issue. We're seeing uh, where the, the Conservative government is at risk of losing a lot of uh, inner city uh, sort of what, they, what they're calling teal seats where uh, they're being challenged by independents who are quite fiscally conservative but are um, quite concerned about the environment and things like that and that and um integrity commission right, as right. well so that's the integrity commission is the other thing that's going on in the background where they want um people to i guess politicians to be held account and not be allowed to be corrupt and, and that's they want to set up an independent commission to look into that sort of stuff so once the election happens on saturday talk about what goes on from there there's this planned meeting of these quad nations they're called on tuesday does this mean that whoever wins the election is going right to that meeting on Tuesday or is there kind of a longer process of like an inauguration and certification and Scott Morrison might still get to, to go to that meeting? How does that timeline work? It will be pretty quick if the outcome of the election is uh, quite decisive and that's the, the issue that's not really determined yet. Both leaders have said that they will go if they win the election. So that's, that's not in question. And I think that that's sort of, indicative of how Australia <clears throat> views our relationship with the United States in particular, because it seems no matter which side of politics is in power, that the relationship between Australia and the US is always quite strong. Um, you know, we saw earlier oh, last year the um, the AUKUS agreement signed between Australia, the UK and the US, uh, where we're getting some some submarines from, from the US, um, and that's supported by both sides of politics. Um, so, yeah, it, it will, it, I think it will be pretty quick. Um, the Basically, they... It, once once the election is certified, then you basically have the Governor General who's, who's acting for the Queen um, swear in the new government and then they can be, um, you know, acting as leader for, for as soon as possible, as, as soon as the election's sort of known. It's really going to come down to how quickly we know. And, and because of those, those independent seats that I mentioned earlier and just some other factors and the polls tightening in the last week, it's not really clear whether we're going to know the result on the night. Um, everyone was sort of predicting in 2019 that, uh, it was going to be Labor that won and that didn't happen. So I think that everyone's a little bit, it's similar to the US with what happened in 2016. Everyone's really reluctant to call it because uh, the polls were wrong in 2019. Right. So no one's really sort of keen to call it yet. Now, voting is mandatory in Australia. The fine is 20 Australian dollars, which is about 14 US dollars if you don't vote. But COVID has made it hard for people to just get out and live life in general. So how are officials working around that to make sure everyone can still vote during the pandemic? Yeah, that's been a, a really difficult thing. So we've had a bit of a controversy this week because they made a cutoff of Tuesday night where if you, if you, had, if you had COVID and you were in isolation, um, you, you and you got COVID, you couldn't actually vote by phone, which is why we set up to allow people to vote by phone. Um, but they've just changed it today so that now people can vote by phone if they tested positive from Friday. We've seen a lot of people pre-polling, so that, that means we've had vote, voting centres open for the last two weeks. And I think something like in, in terms of postal votes and pre-poll votes, we've had about 6 million people vote already. So that's like a third of the electorate have already voted already. So 
um, even though, <laughs> you know, it's going to be, it will be quite close and uh, it's really hard to sell. A lot of people have already made up their minds already, clearly. Voting by phone, that will be, that will be quite a conversation in the U.S. if we gave people the option to vote by phone. So I'll be interested to see how that goes in Australia. Josh Taylor, a reporter for The Guardian Australia, we appreciate you making time for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come, more baby formula is heading to the U.S. What are the White House and Congress doing to get that done? And how soon will your local shelves be restocked? U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack answers your questions live. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. It could take a while to restock America's stores with baby formula. But today, officials in Washington took some big steps toward moving that along. Congress passed the Access to Baby Formula Act. It passed the House last night and the Senate today. And now the bill heads to President Biden's desk. The legislation would give the administration more flexibility to let families use a government program to buy formula. These measures should have an impact, but FDA Chief Dr. Robert Califf says not overnight. It will gradually get better. I, you know, uh, the big problem we have right now is distribution, and I think you're very uh, important what you called attention to. The worst problems are in the rural areas because they're not the major uh, areas that are purchasing these goods, and we're going to have to pay very special attention to that. So within days, it will get better, but it will be a few weeks before we're back to normal. Joining us now is the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. He held the same role in the Obama administration, and before that, he served two terms as the governor of Iowa. Mr. Secretary, welcome. We're so glad you're with us. Happy to be with you tonight. This should be a big step forward, I hope, in getting families formula. Talk about the USDA's role in moving formula forward under this measure that moved through Congress. Well, first of all, before we get into the Congressional Act, uh, the president directed uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and USDA to figure out ways in which we could potentially fly formula into the United States uh, from other countries. Uh, and so today, I issued a letter uh, to the Department of Defense, Secretary uh, Austin, requesting that they contract uh, with a, uh, a flight to be able to pick up formula in Switzerland, uh, about one and a half million uh, eight ounce uh, containers of uh, formula that's designed for youngsters who are allergic to cow milk proteins, uh, to get that from Zurich, Switzerland to Indiana as quickly as possible so that we begin immediately uh, to address this issue. Uh, in addition, as you know, the president also directed the Defense Production Act to be uh, triggered that's going to allow, as this, um, the Abbott uh, facility goes back online, to be able to access the, uh, the, the ingredients to be able to produce more. So the combination of those two things together with imports uh, from other countries together with the, the act that Congress has passed should give us an opportunity to uh, very aggressively deal with the shortages that have caused so much stress. Where do things stand tonight in terms of identifying the commercial aircraft that will make these flights? Is that still in the works? Well, I think it's a, a matter of, uh, of hours uh, with the Department of Defense. They have contractors at the ready, uh, and I would expect and anticipate that we're going to see that's done very, very quickly. USDA is doing this because it has the flexibility within its budget to be able to provide the resources to pay uh, for these flights. Uh, and that's the reason why I directed the letter as opposed to Secretary Becerra from HHS. I wonder what the USDA knows at this point in terms of how we got to this point and how to prevent it from happening in the future. One of our viewers, Eric Grill, tweeted, what did Abbott, the manufacturer that makes a lot of America's formula, what did Abbott do to rectify the shutdown and ensure it does not happen again? Secretary Vilsack, we know this happened because of a shutdown at their plant in Sturgis, Michigan, after reports that a number of babies had gotten very sick with bacterial infections. What more do we know now that might prevent this from ever happening again? Well, I think uh, the FDA obviously has learned a great, great deal. They, they are the primary agency, if you will, that oversees the safety of infant formula. 
uh, and I'm sure that as a result of the negotiations that they've had with Abbott in terms of reopening that facility, they've learned a great deal. I think the key here is for us to take a look at ways in which we can have a more resilient system, the ability to provide greater flexibility so that when and if there is disruption, other suppliers can move in more quickly, uh, that we can take steps as we are currently taking to import uh, a formula that is as, as safe uh, as what is being pr uh, produced here in the United States. There may also be an opportunity as well for an expansion of production capacity uh, at some point in time in the future uh, as folks take a look at how to make this system more resilient. What is your sense right now in terms of families being able to use USDA programs like SNAP and WIC and others to get baby formula? There's kind of a combination of federal and state in terms of how those are administered. Do you feel confident that the pathway for families to get all that government aid is clear right now or are there roadblocks that need to be swept away? Well, I think people are very familiar with the WIC program. 86 state agencies operate the WIC program across the United States. Roughly 50% of the formula uh, is basically f distributed through WIC. So I think there's a, a great opportunity here uh, for us to utilize this very popular and important program. One of the challenges, though, is for us to make sure that everyone who uh, can access the WIC program is, in fact, accessing it. Uh, the concern that we have is that there are many eligible folks who are not taking full advantage of the WIC program. So we're in the process of, of analyzing analyzing how we might be able to do an even better job of getting folks into the program, which means they would then obviously have access to the formula. What would you say to parents who may watch this who say, I desperately need formula, I'm not in the program now, but I don't even know how to get plugged in. I, I want to find out whether this would work for me. What would you say to them? USDA.gov, uh, take a look at our, our website. Uh, there's an indication of where the uh, state agencies are. You look for the state agency uh, in the area nearest you, uh, reach out to them, and I'm sure that they will be able to give you information about how to sign up and participate in, in the WIC program. I'm sure you and the administration have had your hands very full dealing with inflation, food shortages. You've expressed concern about India banning wheat exports. The whole world is kind of belt tightening right now. Another one of our viewers responded to some of these inflationary forces. Ray tweeted, sticker shock is the best way to describe it. I haven't heard about much progress on the supply system issues since the president took office. The media seems to downplay it. I don't think the administration has a clue regarding inflation. Secretary Vilsack, what would you say to Ray? Well, I would say that uh, uh, we need to do a better job of communicating to Ray uh, exactly what we actually have done. The president's been very focused on this. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the things that we've done at USDA is to take a look at this issue of supply chain. Uh, we're providing grants. We're providing resources to be able uh, to expand competition, to create new opportunities, for example, in the meat processing area. Uh, we are in the process of, of uh, taking a look at over 275 applications for expanded meat processing, which will create options in the grocery store. Uh, we're working with uh, uh, the ports, we're working with shipp shippers to basically free up uh, a lot of the, the uh, congestion that occurred at the ports that disrupted the supply chain uh, earlier this year. Uh, we're seeing uh, more product getting into this country. We're also uh, making it easier for more product to get out of this country in terms of agricultural exports. So there are steps being taken. Uh, the president has taken a look at the issue of gas, obviously, and the high cost of gas uh, tapped in the strategic oil reserve. Uh, basically approved E15 uh, for summer use, all of which expands uh, the supply uh, of gasoline. And hopefully over the course of time, uh, these actions and a number of other actions that the Federal Reserve is taking uh, will provide for, uh, for a, a better circumstance in terms of inflation. But it is something the president takes uh, very seriously and is something he's focused on every single day. And very briefly, Secretary, I know I'm out of time, but I got to ask you with regard to the war in Ukraine and its impact on the food supplies around the world. How confident are you that USDA and the administration have the tools they need to mitigate those impacts? Or are we kind of at the mercy of Russia and Vladimir Putin and Volodymyr Zelensky to bring the war to a swift conclusion so we can get things back on track? Well, clearly the war in Ukraine has basically caused a problem in terms of access to, to uh, food products uh, and foodstuffs in, in the Middle East and North, North Africa. We're addressing that issue with the Ukraine uh, supplemental 
uh, bill that was passed recently by Congress by the work that the USDA has in tapping uh, a trust fund that we have to provide additional emergency food assistance. So we're going to make sure that uh, that we do everything we possibly can to provide food uh, and stability in those North African and, and Middle Eastern countries that could be negatively impacted. We're also going to continue to work and try to figure out ways in which the, uh, the grain that is currently stored in Ukraine, roughly 20 million metric tons, can get out of the Ukraine. Obviously, to the extent that we can uh, figure out ways to either uh, open up the ports or provide an overland route, uh, we'll certainly right. continue to work uh, dip our diplomatic channels to get that done. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack. Mr. Secretary, it's good to have you on. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Baby formula is just one concern on many parents' minds tonight. These days, we're also talking about COVID boosters and even monkeypox. Dr. Kavita Patel has what you need to know next. And later, discussing politics with people can be exhausting. But we'll meet some college students working to change that in tonight's feature report. The baby formula shortage is just one health crisis facing Americans right now. COVID cases are rising again. In the past week, cases nationwide have risen nearly 30%. Vaccinations remain our best defense against severe infections and death. Today, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky signed off on Pfizer's booster for children ages 5 to 11. Let's get into all of that with NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel. And Dr. Patel, let's start with the rise in COVID cases. What's going on there? Yeah, Tashua, we're seeing a rise of cases simply because we have such an infectious strain of the virus combined with very little mitigation measures. I have yet to go somewhere where they have asked for all people to have indoor masking, et cetera. Some places, New York City and pockets of other cities, but not the majority of the country. And that leads to easy contact and transmission. Let's talk about this new advisory with regards to booster shots. Kids 5 to 11 will be able to get them. We noted that the CDC just approved that. The CDC says just about a third of kids have gotten at least one dose. Just over a quarter of kids 5 to 11, we mean, have gotten both doses. Talk to parents about right. getting their kids vaccinated, particularly if they have concerns or hesitancies. There's been a ton of questions about the impact of vaccines on kids in different conditions and possible risk factors. What do we know right now in terms of young children and these vaccines? Yeah, what we know right now is that they're an incredibly safe vaccine and we have data from the boosters that were recently authorized by the FDA to also support the safety. Taking a hard look at all, you know, since November, basically when we've had the five to 11 age group be eligible for the vaccine doses following those doses out and any serious consequences. And I know that's something parents care about, the safety. Then let's look at the efficacy. Even with Omicron, children in that age group who were vaccinated had a 68% less likelihood of being hospitalized. That's pretty significant when you start to then compare the fact that children were hospitalized at a much higher rate during the past month because of Omicron compared to pre-Omicron times. So all of that adds up to a really compelling argument now to get your first doses. And Joshua, to put it uh, in a much more specific point, everyone in America is eligible for a booster. If you can be vaccinated, you should and can get boosted, some even a fourth shot. Still waiting for under five, where we have nothing. But for above five, we have all of these options. And with regard to people who do get infected, there's been a lot more talk lately about antiviral treatments, this medication Paxlovid. If kids get infected, are those approved for children or just the vaccine is approved for kids? Which is it? No, we do. We have treatments for Paxlovid specifically. It's still limited to ages 12 and up. There are reports of pediatricians who have been able to kind of make a compassionate use request. This is something we can do with other drugs as well for under 12, but very limited. We also do have monoclonal antibodies that can also be done in the, in the uh, teen age group, but not for younger kids. But here's good news. Remdesivir, we've used that drug all throughout this pandemic, and it has been shown to be effective, can be used in as young as 28 days. Of course, limited to you know people in the hospital or you need to take it through IV. So Joshua, it's not as easy as a pill that you can fill at CVS, but I think that does give us way more than what we had just even three months ago. Let me ask you about monkeypox. There's a case that has been identified in Massachusetts. 
There's also been a case identified here in New York City, and there's been con some concern in Europe that there may be something of a, a transmission cluster among men who have sex right. with men. What is monkeypox, and why is it spreading right now? Yeah, Joshua, trust me, this is like the last thing you wanted to kind of hear a CDC alert about because it just feels like we're For overwhelmed. For real, like but we're dealing me, with COVID <laughs> already, and now yeah, we, we've I, got enough I, uh, to deal with, and then monkeypox. You can imagine the texts going around my colleagues, my physician friends and uh, nursing friends. So let me just kind of oh simplify where we're at with it. We still don't know a lot about these cases in the United States and trying to explore that. But monkeypox has been around since the 1950s. It's in that same family of DNA viruses that smallpox is in. And in fact, that pox, P-O-X, kind of marks can be a hallmark of monkeypox. It has always usually been animal to human transmission. Human to human transmission, transmission has occurred but it's not as easy as animal to human. And it's generally through large droplets and prolonged contact. So it's different than some of what we've been learning about with COVID. And if there is good news to be had in any outbreak or situation where we don't know much, we've known a lot about this virus, and we know that there's some cross-reactivity and protection from the smallpox vaccine, a vaccine that we've had for a long time. So all in all, still needs to be studied. But trust me, Joshua, I'm hoping that we can kind of get to the bottom of this and reassure the public that they don't have to worry about another virus looming around the corner. So you, you mentioned um, large droplets, prolonged contact. That would kind of at least make me think that maybe this cluster in Europe is more likely just sexual transmission from someone who happened to unfortunately right. have monkeypox, right? Right. That's more likely because we have seen clusters like this. I think what's unusual has been that we're seeing this in other countries and we haven't actually right. traced kind of, you know, exactly how, what, when and where. But I'm confident that some of our epidemiology colleagues from the CDC are going to do that because this is a high priority. And again, we do have treatment available and then a vaccine that has cross reactivity available. And the majority of people that do get this actually do fine. It has a higher one to 10 percent kind of death rate. So that's uh, obviously something that we'll watch very closely, but the majority of right. people do fine. Dr. Kavita Patel, monkeypox. Oh my gosh. I, I almost want to see the texts and then I really don't. But I appreciate hearing yeah. from you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will get to some, can you imagine? I can only imagine what they're talking. Anyway, we'll get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including the latest developments in the trial of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, a bill that could soon give Oklahoma the strictest abortion laws in America and another rough day on Wall Street. That's all just ahead. Stay close. Tonight's headlines begin in court after that deadly mass shooting in Buffalo. The man accused in that racist attack remained mostly silent during today's hearing. Families of the victims did not. Peyton Gendron made a brief court appearance. A grand jury indicted him on one charge of first-degree murder. That charge covers all 10 people he is accused of killing. Gendron wrote online that he had planned last weekend's attack and laid out his racist motivations for it. As he was led out of the courtroom, one victim's family member yelled, Peyton, you're a coward. Most of the 13 people who died that day were black. The shooting happened at a grocery store in a predominantly black neighborhood of Buffalo. That store remains closed, forcing residents to look elsewhere for food. I want the community to know that I spoke with the Attorney General of the United States this morning, Mayor Garland. He is aware of the situation and the need for the supermarket in this community that is a food desert. He is committed and he has been committed to making sure that this supermarket could be returned and open to the community as soon as possible. The next court appearance is set for June 9th. Hate crime and terrorism charges are still pending. Actress Amber Heard continued her defense against Johnny Depp's defamation lawsuit. Today, her lawyers brought in an array of witnesses from Mr. Depp's past. They included a former agent and an ex-best friend. Today also focused on Ms. Heard's countersuit. NBC's Steve Patterson has more. 
Yeah, it was a day of video depositions. Heard's team essentially calling the ghosts of Johnny's past with a number of character witnesses, one after another after another, all of them kind of pertaining to attest to Johnny Depp's tattered past, uh, as Heard's team would put it. You know, one was a software engineer analyzing some of the tweets that have been made surrounding all of this. Another one was his former business manager that attested to his lavish lifestyle and how he kind of overstepped his bounds over the years. Another one was uh, his former agent, who he fired uh, after they had worked together for 30 years. And she testified about how unprofessional uh, he claimed to be on the set, often ending up late. That pertains to this whole thing because Johnny Depp alleges in this suit um, that Amber Heard's allegations caused him to get fired from several projects. Well, now they're calling his character into question before that even happened. Uh, another one was his former friend, best friend. Uh, who alleged that Johnny would often go into these jealous tirades, of course, more about the drugs and alcohol use that we saw. And, of course, that's something that Heard's team has alleged since really day one of this trial uh, and talked more about that. I think the most famous one, Actress Ellen Barkin, who was an item with Johnny Depp back in the late 90s, they worked on Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas together. Barkin testified that, yeah, Johnny Depp was this jealous guy that abused drugs and alcohol often. And even that at one point that he threw a bottle of wine uh, in her direction, all of this sort of adding up to Heard's argument, which is trying to paint Johnny Depp uh, as a jealous abuser, uh, not only of drugs and alcohol, but as somebody that verbally, emotionally, physically, and sexually abused her. This uh, will not resume tomorrow. The trial picks up next week. A few more days of this. We could even see Johnny Depp back on the stand if Heard chooses to call him back. And then closing arguments scheduled to wrap up on May 27th. Back to you. Thank you, Steve. That was NBC's Steve Patterson reporting. Oklahoma's governor could soon sign one of the nation's strictest anti-abortion bills into law. The state house approved the measure. It bans abortions at conception and outlaws just about all abortions. Exceptions include cases that threaten the mother's life or when the pregnancy is a result of rape or incest that has been reported to law enforcement. Much like a law in Texas, this bill would let private individuals sue providers or anyone who helps someone get an abortion. Oklahoma is already one of 13 states that we've highlighted in red with trigger laws. They will kick in if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. Abortion would become illegal there if that happens. This is not the only anti-abortion law to gain traction in Oklahoma this year. Back in April, Governor Kevin Stitt signed a law making it a felony for doctors to perform abortions. Medical professionals could get up to $100,000 fines and face up to 10 years in prison. It was another rough day on Wall Street. The Dow closed down 236 points. Yesterday, the index had its worst session since 2020. Things weren't much better for the S&P or the Nasdaq. You can see they both ended in the red as well. But the S&P is getting dangerously close to bear market territory. The bear market is when an index drops 20 percent from its high. Inflation is largely to blame for all this volatility. We'd like to know how your portfolio is doing these days. What about your 401k or your pension? We'd like to answer some of your questions about what's working for you and what's not. So email us. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. We'll have a market expert answer some of your questions soon. Don't know if you noticed, but in the last five minutes, we mentioned guns and abortion, two very divisive topics. What would it take to help more Americans agree to disagree? Some organizations are helping folks listen, not despite their differences, but through them. We'll show you before we go. Pennsylvania's Republican Senate primary is still on. NBC News has yet to project a winner. We consider the race between Dr. Mehmet Oz and David McCormick too close to call. As you can see, there's barely 1,100 votes separating them. So this race could very well head to a recount. 
Officials with the Pennsylvania Department of State, which runs elections, says they have about 38,000 absentee ballots left to count. Around 8,700 of those mail-ins are from Republicans. NBC's Dasha Burns has the latest. We did this in 2020. We're doing this again. It is uh, days after an election. We still don't have an outcome, largely because of those mail-in ballots. Also because it is an extremely tight race, and we are probably going into recount territory here. Uh, but the reason we're still waiting on, on just the results from Election Day is because this is an incredibly tedious and manual process. And in Pennsylvania, election workers aren't able to start touching those mail-in ballots until 7 a.m. on Election Day day and in order to get those mail-in ballots scanned they have to uh, process them through these electronic envelope openers here there's a mail-in envelope there's a secrecy sleeve and they have to flatten that ballot to prepare it to get scanned again manual tedious but thorough uh, we also have here a room full of election observers here. We've got folks from the McCormick campaign, folks from the Barnett campaign, folks from the Oz campaign, all here uh, observing the process. And because it is so incredibly close, as they are trying to finish up the count from Election Day, they are also preparing to do a recount. That is very likely to happen. You're probably going to see me in another room just like this. You might even see more observers here because both of these campaigns have fought hard. They they have spent millions and billions of dollars, and this could turn into a protracted fight here. It could indeed. Thank you, Dasha. That was NBC's Dasha Burns reporting. How should you deal with people whose politics you hate? Maybe you should talk to them. Debate them if you want, but have some dialogue with decency. Some of America's college students are volunteering to start those dialogues. They did not create these divides. But can they find ways to close them? In tonight's feature report, we caught up with the group Bridge USA at a training summit in Washington. We've got to dress this up with urgency. We've got to show a theory of change because all of us are unsatisfied and people are going to ask the question when you go back to campus, talk, is it really enough? Actually, it may be more than enough, at least the way Bridge USA does it. Manu Meal founded the club as a freshman at UC Berkeley. We created a space for people to simply just listen to each other. Bridge USA has 51 chapters nationwide. Its mission? Fight divisiveness with dialogue and debate. Most young people in the country are very dissatisfied with how toxic and tribal our politics are, and they're disengaging in troves, not because they don't care about our democracy, but because they see the loudest voices on the temperamental extremes dominating our politics. Those extremes inspired Meal back in 2017 after a high-profile conflict at Berkeley. Hundreds of student protesters refused to let Breitbart editor Milo Yiannopoulos speak at a campus event. The university blamed a smaller group of agitators for violence around the peaceful protests. We distinctly remember me and a couple of strangers at that time. We created a space for people to simply just listen to each other. And importantly, it wasn't a space to achieve common ground, compromise. It was simply a space for understanding, for holding each other's experiences purely to understand why someone else believes what they believe. This spring, Meal and his team took a road trip to visit nine of Bridges' chapters. They called it the Let's Blanking Talk to Each Other campaign. First stop, Minnesota, for a discussion on critical race theory. Along the way, the group dove headfirst into topics like abortion, vaccine mandates, and social media's role in democracy. The trip culminated with a national summit in Washington, D.C. Bridge leaders from around the country held discussions and trainings on how to have more of these difficult conversations. This is extra credit. This is unlikely. We're not supposed to be here. We're two blocks away from the Capitol and currently living in one of the most polarized times in our country's history with young people across the country choosing a politics of division and exclusion over a politics of hope and, um, and optimism. On the first night of the conference, students held a parliamentary-style debate on extremist ideas in American society. I understand that some of these things are just ideas, but a few blocks away at the Capitol, we see that ideas become actions. So my question, I guess, is how do we stop dangerous ideas from becoming dangerous action? So I think if we come into it with a view of tolerance, our refutations of those ideas can be more effective and prevent the violence that I know we all want to prevent. The format demanded respect, open-mindedness, and curiosity. That made this tough conversation easier and even fun. 
Um, I feel that uh, ideas that are dangerous to American society should not be tolerated simply because uh, if we tolerate, okay, you know what, no, I'm just going to say what I was going to say from the start. Um, I'm confused and I want help. Uh, so. Bridge USA does have some help from partner organizations. Braver Angels applies a similar approach to political discourse beyond college campuses. The group has grown from meeting in a church basement in 2016 to hosting community workshops nationwide. And the idea was, could we bring people together? These were neighbors. These were people from that part of Ohio. Uh, could they come together and talk with and to each other rather than about each other and at each other. Co-founder Bill Doherty is a licensed marriage and family therapist. He says he applies his counseling techniques to group discussions on politics. This emotional, relational polarization is, has, been, has just crept upon us in the last 30 years, and we've got to do something about it, just like in a family or in a marriage. When you get to that level, uh, you just can't get stuff done together. Groups like Bridge USA and Braver Angels are having some success with the public. But what about politicians? Political scientist Danny Hayes of the George Washington University says the biggest changes need to come from them. The behavior of politicians and the kind of polarization in elite rhetoric that you know characterizes our politics today, much of that is a product of our electoral system and some of the structural forces. We're going to try and give our Republicans, the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help, we're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. Our electoral college system, as well as the design of the Senate, um, create incentives for political parties um, sometimes to basically appeal to a minority of the population because they don't have to win a majority or be the most popular party in order to win elections. The Republicans have won two elections in the last 20 years in which the Republican candidate did not win the popular vote. Capitol Hill has made some efforts to become more transparent and effective. Back in 2019, it created a select committee on the modernization of Congress. It's chaired by Democrat Derek Kilmer of Washington State. I'm conscious of the fact that I'm part of an institution that, according to recent polling, is less popular than head lice colonoscopies and the rock band Nickelback. And uh, part of that is because I think the American people are uh, tired of partisan bickering. They want to see more progress on their behalf. Chairman Kilmer says one opportunity lies in breaking down how partisanship is baked into the House and Senate. You know, so you're, you're, you're basically separated by party from the beginning. So one of our recommendations was stop doing that. Like part of the discussion, part of the orientation in Congress should be about how we encourage collaboration and civility, not how we b pull people apart. If you want things in Congress to work differently, then you have to do things differently. Republican Congressman William Timmons of South Carolina is the committee's vice chair. We've relied on a number of different organizations. We, we, uh, we call it the cohort, and it's literally two dozen groups that are interested in making Congress less dysfunctional and um, try to really get this place back on track. Back in February, Chairman Kilmer introduced the Building Civic Bridges Act. It would provide government funding to organizations like Braver Angels and Bridge USA. The bill has yet to clear the Education and Labor Committee on its way to the House for a possible vote. Whether it passes or not, Manu Meal says Bridge USA's work must continue for the sake of democracy. I'm not asking you to sit around a table and talk to each other just for the sake of talking. I'm asking you to sit around a table and talk to each other because understanding is what creates the groundwork for change to happen. And after a weekend of intense political discussions, its members were ready to make new connections back home. Some said the key is a very simple thing. Empathy. I've learned a lot of empathy. And it's not just through having conversations, it's also managing people. I think this idea of leading with empathy and really just trying to engage with people on an individual level, seeing them as just only representatives of themselves, not a representative of a larger group, um, is very unique to politics. We're all humans and we can all achieve great things. We have a common purpose. Very cool. And thanks to Natalie Ross and Matt Donlan and editor David Hall for that feature report. Well, it's graduation season, speaking of college students, and many colleges and universities are holding their first in-person commencements since COVID hit. 
Yesterday, we told you that Taylor Swift gave a stadium full of NYU grads and probably a few Swifties her best advice. Learn to live alongside cringe. No matter how hard you try to avoid being cringe, you will look back on your life and cringe retrospectively. Stop reading my mind, Taylor Swift. We asked you for some of your favorite commencement speeches. Here's what Liza left in our inbox. This is in regards to commencement speeches. It is not the one that I received, but the one that my son received from a future president of the United States, a junior senator named Barack Obama, when he was at the University of Chicago. It changed his life. I can imagine. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. A few of you mentioned a speech by retired Navy Admiral William McRaven. His 2014 commencement address to the University of Texas at Austin included some simple but excellent advice for those longhorns. Start every day by making your bed. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, <laughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. Keep sending us your stories about inspiring commencement addresses. Leave us a voicemail or send us an email. Please join us tomorrow. Harry Smith's in the chair. But until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.